As we, uh, as we look at this again, we started last week, we're going to look at some things, and we're going to be on this a few weeks, and I believe it'll make a huge impact in your life if you will, uh, if you'll apply some of these things. And so, as always, you need to get in agreement and have ears to hear, because uh, a lot of you have heard scriptures, you've heard them over and over, but you need the anointing of the Holy Spirit to all of a sudden, boom, a light clicks on. The entrance of your word gives light. That means it, when it gets in there, all of a sudden, something, something happens. And I've had that experience several times with the Lord where I'd be reading a passage of Scripture, maybe I've read 50 times. And all of a sudden, boom, it's like, oh, wow. Well, we need an oh, wow. Are you here? So let's everybody get in agreement. We want to hear what God has to say. <clears throat> So I'm going to pray you listen. Heavenly Father, we just come to you and we agree in the name of Jesus Christ. You said two or three gathered together in my name. There am I. So we already know you're here. And we're asking you then to minister to us and to speak to us and to help us. We want to know the truth. We want to know, and we want to know how to receive when we pray. We want to know what your word says about prayer. And you know every person in here, what we're in now, what we came out of, where we're headed, the tests, the trials, you know how to help us. <clears throat> Not only do you know how, you want to. So I'm asking you to speak to us. We believe that we receive your supernatural help by the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name, and we'll give you praise and glory for all the fruit that's born. And everybody who agreed said, Amen. Amen. All right. So we're starting in Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, Ephesians 6 is basically talking about putting on the full armor of God. And it's telling us we need to stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil that is out there. Whether you like it or not, there's an adversary. He hates your guts. If he can kill you and take you out early, he will. A lot of people are just floating through life. They're just very ignorant about your adversary, the devil. First Peter 5 talks about he goes around like a, a roaring lion and they just, they don't, I mean, it's like they have no clue. We don't want to be clueless people. There is an adversary. He doesn't like us. We need to be pre prepared because verse 9 says, whom resist? We need to learn how to stand against him. And when he comes against us, we need to have something to say and we need to have power that we can shut him up with and shut down his attack. Are you here? So we have this. He says, put on the full armor of God. He talks about all the armor. He gets down into verse uh, 18, and notice what it says in verse 18, Ephesians 6. He starts talking about prayer. So after you have the armor on, then there's prayer. With all prayer, he says, and petition, pray with specific requests at all times on every occasion and every season in the Spirit. And with this in view, stay alert with all perseverance and petition, interceding in prayer for all God's people. That's verse 18. So, uh, he tells us, pray with all manner of prayer. The Good Speed Translation says, use every kind of prayer. Say, every kind of prayer. So, it says, use every kind of prayer, and at every opportunity, pray in the Spirit. So, there's more than one kind of prayer. A lot of people have done prayer, you know, and they just, they just say, well, prayer's prayer, and they just mix it all up in the box and they don't understand there's all kinds of different types of prayer and prayers like sports, as I've always said. Yeah, soccer is sports and, and baseball is sports and football is sports and track and field is sports and some people think bowling is sports and, and so you have all of these different sports but there's different rules that apply to all of them. And you can't take the, 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 the rules that apply to baseball and then apply it to football. And that's what people do with prayer. And they just think, well, I've heard this about prayer. And they're just, but they don't know there's different kinds of prayer. There's the prayer of consecration and commitment. That's what Jesus prayed when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. If it be thy will, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You can put an if in that kind of prayer because you don't know. Lord, if you want me to, to be a missionary, I'll be a missionary. If you want me to start a business, I'll start a business. If you want me to become a doctor, I'll become a doctor. Whatever it is, if, if it, whatever your will is, that's what I want. You can put an if in that prayer. That's prayer of consecration and commitment. You can't put an if in a prayer to receive. 
You got to know ahead of time what God's will is when it's a prayer to receive. There's also prayers of worship. There's prayers of agreement. Two of you shall agree on earth. We're going to talk about that one tonight. So there's all kinds of different prayers, prayers of thanksgiving, praying in the spirit, prayers of intercession. And a lot of people just, they don't know the different kinds of prayer. And I don't know that we're going to go through all of that because I'm kind of going to focus on praying to get results or how to get an answer about something that you need. You, you need this. Maybe you need a job. Maybe you need, you know, whatever it is, a healing. Maybe you need a, 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 another car. Yours is not working. I mean, how do, you, how do you pray and receive? And so we're kind of focused on that. So uh, there is a different dimension Or let me put it this way, there are different dimensions to the Christian life. Prayer is one dimension of the Christian life. We also already know that we're supposed to be disciples of Jesus and that we we should have fruit in our life. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. And so it glorifies God when we're Christians that bear fruit, that identify us as being part of, of Jesus Christ, part of his kingdom, disciples of Jesus. And that's wonderful if you're going to have, you know, on Sunday mornings we're talking about an abundant life, living, you know, Jesus adored to, to abundant living. Well, part of that is having the fruit of the Spirit in your life, love, joy, and peace, and being generous and giving and kind. And that brings wonderful things into your life. And we need to learn to have self-control and all the fruit of the Spirit mentioned in Galatians 5. That's one dimension to life. But let me tell you something. There's some wonderful people that do walk in love and they have the fruit of the Spirit in their life, but they don't get their prayers answered. You don't get your prayers answered because you're a good, mature Christian. You don't get your prayers answered just because you have the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Are you here? If I mean, I wish it was that way. It's not that way. So what did the Bible say? You need to have, you need to find out See, me, I I like to know, okay, if I prayed and I didn't get a result, why? And so we're looking at some whys and some things that are necessary to get results, to pray to where we get results when we pray. And I think that's important to everybody's life. Can I get an amen from you? So you do have to pray. If you're going to have God's will in your life, you got to pray. Didn't Jesus, you know, some people have this crazy religious idea. Well, the will of God just automatically comes to pass anyway. He's just working everything out. And I mean, it's all going to happen. And so if that's the will of God, it's just going to happen. Well, then why would you need to pray? If the will of God's going to happen automatically, why would you need to pray? Why in the world would Jesus say in Matthew 6, 10, pray thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven if it just automatically came to pass? Wouldn't that be silly? Huh? This automatically comes to pass. Why would he tell you to pray thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? No, we want God's will. And God's will is wonderful. He has a plan for our life to give us hope in the future. So there's a lot of things we need to learn about prayer. And that's kind of what we started on. So last week we said this, and I'm going to hit these fast and then go to the last two that I'm talking about now. The first one we said about prayers, pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. Pray to the Father in Jesus' name. A lot of Christians don't even follow that instruction that Jesus gave them. And they'll start out praying, oh God, or they'll start out praying, you know, Jesus, we're just coming to you. Well, he didn't say to do that. We live in a new covenant. And in the new covenant, in John 16, 23, this is right before Jesus was going to be crucified and resurrected from the dead. He said, there's a new day coming. So, so, so this is the end of Jesus' earthly ministry and he's telling some very important things to his disciples. Extremely important about what's going to happen. And he's fixing to go away and he said, sorrow's filled your heart and he's got all this. But he said, now, uh, but, but your sorrow is going to go away and no man will take it away from you. And in that day, you shall ask me nothing. What day? The day of the new covenant the day when he's been crucified, resurrected from the dead. He said, you won't ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. So he said, you're supposed to, in the day of the new covenant, you go to the Father and you pray in the name of Jesus. 
Because Jesus is the one that has the account with God. It don't matter how good you think you are. You're, you're not too good anyway. But, but I, I'm just telling you, uh, you don't go bragging on yourself and what all you've done and how you're the best Christian in the church or whatever you think you are. You go to the Father in the name of Jesus. Jesus has the standing and Jesus has such a relationship with the Father that he said, I tell you what, you go to the Father, you use my name, he'll give it to you. And then he said in the next verse, hitherto or up until now, you've asked nothing in my name. And they didn't. They didn't have to ask in his name. They could ask him right then. He'd been with them for three and a half years. But he said, up until now, you've asked nothing in my name, but in that day, ask and you what? There's an outside chance you might get it. Is that what he said? Ask and you shall receive. Why? So your joy will be made full. Let me just tell you something. If you're not getting answers to prayer, your joy is not full. Your joy is not full. Let me tell you something. If your kids are homesick, I mean, if, if uh, your business is about to collapse, your finances are falling through the floor, they're fixing to repossess everything you have, and you're praying about it, uh, look, don't tell me that your joy is full. Jesus said, ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. Receiving from God brings some great joy in your life. Can I get an amen from you? And I mean, probably, uh, hopefully, many of you in here have experienced times when you've prayed and you've received from God, and I mean, it just brings joy into your life. So, you have to go to the Father in the name of Jesus, and you ask the Father in Jesus' name. Everybody say it out loud. Ask the Father in Jesus' name. Second thing we said is you need to have God's word in your heart concerning your need. Now, if I was going to, you know, there could be a lot of areas where people miss it, but this is a big area people miss it. They pray way too soon. They're not ready to pray yet. They don't have God's word about whatever the subject is. If they need healing, if they need finances, what did he say about that? The fact that God has ability, well, I mean, Elon Musk, like I said last week, he could give you a million dollars in a new Tesla. He has the ability to do that. There's no reason for you to get all excited about it unless he gave you his word that he would, or he did. If he came up here and stood on the stage and said, hey, you know what? You don't know it yet, but I, brought, I got bankers out there, and I've got, I got a million dollars for every person in here, and I've got keys to a brand new Tesla out there. I've done that for you now. Well, then now you've got something to be happy about. God's got ability, but you have to find out, well, what did he say about this subject? What did he say about a job? What did he say about getting this answer? And you've got to get that in your heart. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you will and it'll be done unto you. So you need to get God's word on the inside of you about whatever the circumstance or the situation is. Remember, it's with the heart man believes. You don't believe just because you, you have some intellectual discourse in your mind. You've got to get it in your heart. The word of God has, it, like I've told you, it has a displacing effect. Romans 10, put it up there. Romans 10, verse 10, notice what it says. For with a heart man believes, for with a heart man, for with what? How does a man believe? With a heart man believes unto righteousness. And with a mouth confessions made unto salvation. But it all starts, you got to get something in your heart. With a heart man believes. And you got to believe in your heart. And, and you got to get God's word in your heart then. So it's like I said, you could have a glass of, you know, you had milk last night before you went to bed and you didn't drink it on, got a half glass of milk. Well, you can put that milk under a faucet and run pure water in it and it will displace the milk eventually. You just keep running water in it. Well, that's the way hearing the truth over and over is. Faith comes by hearing God's word and it, it has a displacing effect. Over time, it starts, it starts causing the unbelief and the fear and the insecurity to, to, and the uncertainty to leave when you just keep hearing God's word and hearing God's word and hearing God's word, it displaces all of that. But you've got to get God's word on the inside. You've got to let his words be abiding in you and you've got to get it in your heart. And then the third thing we talked about last week, but I'm going to hit it again, believe you receive when you pray. Now, a lot of Christians think they do that and they don't actually do that. In Mark eleven twenty four, 24, Jesus said, Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, 
what things soever you desire. What, how many things? Whatsoever things you desire. When you pray, believe you receive them and, and you shall have them. When are you supposed to believe you receive it? When you pray, not when it looks like it. Not when the lump disappeared and the pain disappeared and you say, wow, praise the Lord. You believe you receive it when you pray. Now, this is not my rule. No man made this up. This is what Jesus said about prayer. He said, when you pray, believe you receive it and you shall have it. Believing you receive it is a step that you have to take if you're going to get over here to the you shall have it. He could have said, he could have said about prayer, look, when you really need something and you're in a jam, just keep praying and praying and begging God. And you beg and you beg and you beg and you prove to me that you're sincere and you'll get it. But he didn't say that. He didn't say that. That's not how it works. He didn't say, just keep begging. He didn't say, just keep praying. Prove to me that you're sincere. Do a little bit of fasting. Call everybody that you know. Get on, get on all the prayer chains everywhere. You just keep proving you're sincere and you keep begging and you keep begging and you keep begging and you keep begging and you'll get it. But that's not what Jesus said about it. He said, whatever you desire when you pray, you take this step, believe that you receive it, and then you'll have it. Believe you receive it and then you'll have it. You got to do your believing you receive it before you have it, before you feel any change, before the job you applied for, before they call you and say, you have, you have this job, or before the, the people, the real estate company calls you and says, guess what, your house is sold. No, you got to believe that you've received the answer to your prayer before there's any, ever, any other evidence. Otherwise, you're not walking by faith. You're walking by sight. If you wait until you see it and feel it, then that's not faith. Remember, you remember in John 20, uh, Jesus' disciple Thomas, he wasn't there when the Lord appeared to the other disciples. And, and Thomas made this statement. He said, unless I, can, unless I can see the print of the nails in his hand and put my finger in the hole of the nails, unless I can thrust my hand into his side, this is John 20. You don't have to put it up there, guys. He said, I will not believe. And then later, Jesus appeared to him and said, Thomas, uh, get over here and put your finger in my hand and thrust your hand in my side and be not faithless, but believing. If you wait until you see it and you feel it, Jesus said, you're faithless. And you can't please God without faith. For without faith, it's impossible to please him. Is that right? So, so he expects you to believe that he's honest and he answered your prayer. You know, I went to work for a guy, for a company. It was actually a Fortune $500 company, but, uh, you know, it was the manager of, the, of a plant that they were building in the Metroplex. And I went in and applied for the job. You know, I'm, I guess I was 20 years old and uh, went in and talked to the man there. He was out of the Marines, had got out of the Marine Corps. Just like I said, almost everybody there was ex- Marine or ex-Navy. And so I get there and I apply for the job. And, and so he's out of the Marine Corps. He's the manager of this plant, air separation plant is what it was. And he said, yeah, I'll hire you. I'll give you a job. He told me how much he'd pay. Stuck out. We shook hands about it. I filled out a little bit of paperwork. He said, all right, come start to work. He said, now you're going to get paid. Uh, did they pay every two weeks or once a week? I think they paid every week. Every week they paid. He said, all right, so you'll have to work a week and then you'll get your, you know, get your paycheck. So I went out. I didn't tell the man. I didn't stop and say, well, you know, can you show me the money? I mean, I know that you told me that, that you're going to pay me this much, but just for me to be secure about this, I'd really like to see it. You got any money laying around here? How do I know you're really going to keep your word? You know what? He just said, never mind because he wanted me to treat him like he's honest and God's the same way. And so he tells you, you believe that you've received your answer before you see it and you shall have it. Believe you've got it and then you'll get it. 
And that, that is a step you have to take. Believing you've received brings your answer out of the unseen realm. God is a spirit. We're spirit beings. It brings your answer out of the unseen realm. You believe you've received it, but you don't see it yet, and you just keep believing you've received it, and then it'll come into the physical realm. Because God answers you when you pray, and when you believe you receive it, boom. Boom. But it takes, sometimes it takes a period of time for it to get out of the spiritual, invisible realm and into the physical realm. Notice in Joshua chapter 6, how did, how did they take Jericho? So you know the whole story. They came out of Egypt. Went the, the, all of their parents died. All of their ancestors died in the wilderness because they would not believe God. And the Bible says they did not enter into the land of promise, which is the best God had for them because of unbelief. They didn't get in. But Joshua and Caleb, the only two from that generation that got in there was Joshua and Caleb. And they had a different spirit. What was their spirit? They had a spirit of faith. So they knew how faith operated. So finally, after the old generation dies out, Joshua and Caleb take all the young ones. They're fixing to go in. And the very first city they came up against was a walled city. I mean, they talk about how big the walls were. They did chariot races around the top of the walls. Naturally speaking, there's no way that these slaves coming out of people who've been out in the desert are going to go knock, take those walls down and take this city. But, but God gave them instruction, and the instruction was you march around the city every day, once a day for seven days. On the seventh day, you shout, and you start. You shout, and you blow the trumpets. So that was their instruction. We'll notice. So in Joshua 6, here's what he said. It came to pass on the seventh time when the priest blew the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. Huh? Why are they shouting right now? Just because he said the Lord has given you the city. Had they killed all the people yet? Are you here? Were the people dead yet? Were the walls down? Had anything changed? Well, what in the world are they shouting about? They're shouting because of God's word. And notice what it says in verse 20. So the people shouted when the priest blew with the trumpet. After they shouted, after they shouted, it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and, and they took the city. And verse 21 says, and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city. So they had to do the shouting while the walls were up. That's faith. Faith doesn't wait until it sees, until it feels something, until it has a better report. Faith believes God's word and acts like God's word is true. Faith acts on God's word before there's any evidence. That's what makes it faith. And I've heard people say, well, I just can't believe. I just can't believe that. That's a lie. That's not accurate. That's not accurate. That's a lie. You can't believe that. The issue is not that you can't believe. The issue is, unless I can see, unless I can touch, I will not believe. Faith is a choice to, to decide I'm not going by what I see and I'm not going by what I feel. It's a choice that I'm going by what God said even though I don't see, see it or feel it. And he gave you the right to be able to choose that. That's why Jesus said, fear not, believe only. You remember? Well, he wouldn't tell you to do something you cannot do. So when people say, I just wish I could believe that, you can believe it. What you're actually saying is I choose not to believe that. I choose not to believe that. You can believe. Besides that, you're already a believer. You've already believed for something you can't see. You've never seen heaven. You didn't see Jesus die. You didn't see the book your name's written down in. But yet you believe. Why? You choose to believe that. That's what faith is. All right, so the fourth thing we're talking about, we're going to talk about this prayer. You need to learn to praying in agreement. We're talking about how to, how to be effective in prayer, praying to get results. This is one of the greatest things. If you learn this, if you're married, the, probably the most effective thing you can do is a husband and a wife that are in agreement 
or if you don't have a spouse that you can agree with, or if your spouse is not saved, or whatever they can't, they don't understand, can't agree, then you find somebody else who can pray the prayer of agreement. In Matthew 18, 19, here's what the scripture says. If two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them by my Father which is in heaven. Who said that? Jesus. He said, if two of you shall agree on earth, are, are we still on earth? As touching anything they ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. That's what Jesus said about it. But you really have to agree. One person can't be hoping that it's going to be. Well, the, all right, we pray, we agree that it's done. Well, is it done, sister? I sure hope so. <laughs> well, it's not. Because you're over there hoping, and I'm believing. So it, he said, two of you actually have to agree on earth about this thing. You've got to agree that it's done. You've got to agree that it's so. That is the prayer of agreement. One of the most powerful prayers that you can pray is finding somebody who will agree with you concerning something that's obviously according to the word of God and, and you agree that it's done. And, and we've, Veld and I have agreed. That's how we got our first house here in Decatur. We agreed. We lived in Keller and we disagreed, said thank God for our home in Decatur at the time. I mean, there weren't hardly any houses for sale in Decatur. Very, I mean... There was something. We came up here, looked around, looked at all the stuff. There was nothing, especially for us not having any money. That's always a big hindrance. But we agreed for a home in Decatur, and, and then we started thanking God for it. We started shouting while the walls were still up. And every meal when we would eat, we'd thank God for our food, and then we'd say, thank God for a home in Decatur. Praise the Lord Jesus. We thank you for it, Father. And... Uh, I knew Velda liked, you know, she liked the kitchen. So we, I would say, thank God for a home with a remodeled kitchen that Velda really likes and for a really nice bathroom she likes. And so make long story short, we ended up getting that house and it was supernatural. The whole thing was supernatural. We don't have time to go in it. But we agreed and we've done that over and over and over about different things. I, I was thinking about that and I remember years ago. So this, I bet it's been, well, Several years ago, there was a, a young lady in the church and uh, she was still in her teens and she had a premature baby. Really, 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 really premature. So the baby weighed between 1.5 pounds and a little less than two pounds. So it was right in there. Very, I mean, so less than two pounds. And so I get a call from the mother of the young girl and they're at Cook's Children's Hospital. It's the middle of the night. I don't know, well, early in the morning, let's say it that way. And she's, you know, oh my gosh, you know, this happened, this, this happened. And the doctor said, there's no way the baby can live. And uh, we have got to pray. And so I said, all right, here's what, here's what we got to do. You got to forget all about that. You got to forget all about all of this stuff going on out of here is a distraction. What did Jesus say? Two of you have to agree on earth as touching anything they ask, and it'll be done. Now, can we agree the baby will live and not die? Can you do that? She thought a minute and said, Yes, yes, I'll agree. I said, Okay, you know Matthew 18, 19. Tell me what it says. So she quoted Matthew 18, 19. I knew she knew. If two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything they ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. I said, okay, are we on earth? Yeah. Can you agree the child will live and not die? And quit listening to all that. I know what the doctor said. I heard about all. Uh, you've already told me. But we're going to believe the child will live and not die. Can you agree with that? Yes. Okay. I said, okay. So we agree. And then she said, well, they said the child wouldn't live through the night. I said, forget about what they said, that there's no way the child can live through the morning, be dead for them. Forget about all of that. Remember, we agree the child will live and not die. Okay. I said, don't change. Now, when, when you're in a deal like that, you're going to have fearful thoughts hit your mind, aren't you? That doesn't mean you lost. It, 
Faith works in the heart with doubt in the head. Say it out loud. Faith works in the heart with doubt in the mind. So the devil will hit people's mind and they'll start thinking, well, I'm doubting it. Well, really, if you've heard the word of God, you've got faith in your heart. You have a measure of the God kind of faith. You'll have all kind of stuff hit your mind. So we agreed the child live and not die. Well, the child lived through the night, lived a couple of days. Finally, she called and said, uh, I talked to the neonatal, is that what it is? Neonatal unit up here and, and I, I, I asked if you could come in and pray for the baby. So they, I finally got a green that you could do that. So I went up there and I had to wear all the scrubs and I had to wear big long gloves and, and the baby was in a incubator that you couldn't touch the baby. You put your hands in them holes and so, you know, so I had to be scrubbed, do all this. I put my hands through these holes and they had rubber things in there. And so I laid hands on the baby and I said, we've already prayed and agreed. And I found out the child's name. I said, so you, you're going to live and not die. Because Jesus said, if two of you shall agree and I've agreed. And so you're going to live and not die in the name of Jesus Christ. So you might as well recover you might as well grow and be healthy and there won't be any deformity in you whatsoever. So I left, you know. So then almost oh, probably, I think a week went by, maybe a week went by and they accidentally gave the baby some kind of medication that was too much of a dose for a child that weighed less than two pounds. And so she calls, and she's just all in hysterics, said the, ch the child's head's just bloomed up, and this has happened, and now they say that this is going to kill the child. I said, don't pay any attention to all that. Jesus said, if two of you shall agree on earth, we agree the child live and not die. So God, we agreed. Then they called like the next day or two and said, can you come up here? They won't, they, you know, they're going to let you take the baby out of the deal and hold the baby in the, in the room. So I went through all the process, all the scrubs, had on all the stuff. They, the nurse went in, got the baby out of this. And I mean, the baby was about the size of a Coke can, about a Coke can size. And so, I mean, I got this baby like this and I'm just staring got my hands on it and I'm just praising God. I'm not asking God again what things serve you desire when you pray, believe you receive and you'll have it, right? Make a long story short, the child recovered, the child grew up, the child's normal, grew up to be a normal man. Why? If two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything they ask, it'll be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. I thought this was interesting. Had to do with finances. I'm, I'm trying to hurry here. I'm not going to be past eight. So, so this couple bought a... Uh, a piece of land and it, it needed field dirt in it and they bought it for an investment for their retirement. They were older couple and so they got a good deal on it and they put a sign up, clean field dirt wanted, you know, and all this stuff and so times kind of got hard. They put it on the market, went to the real estate company and people were dumping their field dirt in it and so on and so forth and kind of a recession came. Nobody was calling about it. No interest in the land, nothing. And so three years went by and they turned negative. And they'd get angry that they'd spent their money on that and they'd drive by and say, nobody's going to buy that mud hole until they heard about prayer and agreement and about speaking the word of God. And so they heard the teaching and then they, as soon as the church was over, they went, drove over to that, that mud hole and went out there and held hands and said, we agree in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that this is sold. And then they talked to it. Didn't Jesus say to say something to the mountain? Yeah. And they said, we call you sold in the name of Jesus. And we agree you're sold. So then the next day they said we were gonna go, they were going to go up and put it on the um, real estate again, list it. For sale, hadn't been for sale now for three years, no interest because of the kind of a downturn in the economy. So they went up, 
They went uptown to list it with a real estate person, and when they got in there, they saw a guy, out, a businessman outside, and he had, when they first put it on, I think had said something about it, but thought the price was too high, and they kept lowering the price. You know, for a month, they just kept lowering the price, lowering the price. Finally, they took it off the market and hadn't been on the market now for three years. So they, before they listed it, the, the guy felt like he needed to go ask that guy. So he went over and asked that guy. He said, you know, a few years ago, we put this up, and, and uh, didn't you call about it, and you thought it was price too high? And he said, yeah. And he said, well, well you know, we're, we're about to list it again. Would you be maybe interested in buying it? And the guy said, yeah, I'll buy it. And he said, I'll pay you what you, what you listed for at the beginning. And so it sold, and he got the original list price for it instead of the money that he'd been, you know, dropping the price on it. How come? What they changed. They agreed on earth and agreed that it was so. We had another uh, family in the church. Now, these were, you know, they weren't raised, were not church people. They weren't raised in church. They were raised in totally different background. They ended up getting saved. So they're kind of really baby Christians. And one of them had a heart attack. Very, very severe heart attack. So they're at the hospital. So they call. I go up to the hospital. And uh, so the heart attack was severe, and they were going to have to have a, not a, I think a quadruple. Can you do a five bypass? Is there such a thing as that? I think it was a five bypass. And so the doctor had talked to him and said, uh, here's the problem. So I, they had the doctor come over to me the person they were doing the operation on wasn't there. It was the family member or the spouse. And the doctor came up there. And the doctor said, uh, here's the issue. We tried to, you know, we thought we might be able to, to do a, where they run the thing up the veins. But this person's been a heavy smoker for decades. And we tried to do anything, and it tears the, it tears the artery. It's, so th it's paper thin. And so, you know, here, here's the doctor talking. He says, so here's what I, I'm just telling you. We're going to try to reattach these. But from, the, from what we've experienced, this is going to be very, very difficult because of the, we're afraid everything's just going to tear loose because of the, how these, these arteries are so thin from cigarette smoking for decade after decade after decade. So he left. And so I took the husband, went in, said, all right, I mean, you heard what the doctor said. Now you have a choice. We can believe what Jesus said, that, that as the surgery happens, it's going to be successful in full recovery. Or you can not believe. It's up to you. But you're going to have to believe, and you're not going to have to be entertaining that, talking that, or anything else. So we got an agreement. We agreed that the surgery would be successful, and this person would live and not die. The surgery was 100% successful. They lived, didn't die, and that's been 25 years, and they're still alive. I mean, it was, it was I mean, just an outstanding miracle. So there is a prayer of agreement, but you have to be in agreement. And once you get in agreement, and, and I'll be honest with you, sometimes it's hard to stay in agreement. I've woke up in the night and thoughts hitting my mind like a machine gun saying, Boy, you shouldn't have prayed for that. There is no way, like with that baby, wait, you know, there's no way that baby's going to live. You heard what they said. And I said, I refuse to doubt. I will not doubt. I'm a believer. I choose to believe. I believe what God said. I've agreed. That child's going to live and not die. And all the time, the devil's saying, you're an idiot. They're going to know that it don't work now. But I just refuse to doubt. I refuse to entertain those thoughts. And that's why you've got to keep feeding your faith and keep pumping that in and keep hearing that. And it has a displacing effect out of the fear and the doubt and all of the other junk that's there. Can I get an amen from you? So, so if two of you shall agree on earth, all right, it's 801. I guess I'm going to have to quit because I'll just pick up next week right where I'm at. So everybody stand up on your feet. I'm going to go ahead and shut down for tonight and we'll just catch up where we are next week. Is that all right with you? You're going to be here next week. You need to be here next week. You're going to learn something. How you can receive from God. How you can receive from God. How you can get results when you pray. Amen? So, so the prayer of agreement is so powerful. 
What is something you need to be agreeing with with your spouse? Where you both have scripture and you get Matthew 18, 19 and you say, we're agreeing on earth for this. We need, we need this job or we need this health issue or we need, we need this, we need a new vehicle or we need another home or whatever it is. If two of you shall agree, Jesus is the one that said that. He can't lie and if he could lie, he wouldn't lie. But you have to agree and so you meditate those scriptures on agreement. You meditate those scriptures on believing you receive it and, and you get those in your heart and then you find somebody. I, I did this and I, I hate to keep telling stories. I got to tell this one. I'm going to tell one more story real quick. Okay, a builder. I'm going to tell the story about a builder. He was going bankrupt. He moved down here from another state. He built very high dollar homes. He was going bankrupt. He came to me and said, I'm fixing to go bankrupt. I have so many days and I haven't sold these houses. I don't know. They're not selling at all. What are we going to do? I said, well, we're going to pray. He said, man, you got to pray now. I said, no, you're not ready to pray now. You're full of fear. You got to get full of faith. And I said, you take this scripture right here, Matthew 18, 19, Mark 11, 24, believe you receive when you pray. And I said, you take those scriptures right there in John 16, 24, 16, 23, and 24. You meditate those scriptures for three days. And I said, you get back. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go over and roll for three days. Then we're going to get back together and we're going to pray. So three days later, he came back in. I said, did you do what I said? Yes. I said, okay, I did too. So now we're agreeing. And we're agreeing that these houses are selling. You know what happened? Within about two days, somebody came and bought one of the big houses and paid cash for it. And then within about three days, two other houses had contracts on them. Everything started changing. I mean, big time. You know why? If two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything they ask, it shall be done for them by my Father which is in heaven. Jesus said so. If he said it, if he said it, he can make it happen. If he said it, you got his word. And if you got his word on it, you got it. You got it. He can't lie. He is God Almighty. I mean, you agree and you say, here's what the Word of God says, that's mine. Praise God, I tell you what, you start getting results when you pray. Can I get an amen? All right, everybody say that out loud. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I'm a believer. I believe your Word. I believe in the prayer of agreement. I pray and I can agree, and whatever I pray for, it'll be done for me. I have faith. I choose to believe. I am a believer, and I choose to believe the Word of God. Thank you, Father. Your Word is true. I'm growing in faith. I'm growing spiritually. I am an overcomer, and I have world-overcoming faith in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Give the Lord some praise. God bless you guys. All right, I love you. Jesus loves you. You can consider yourself dismissed, and we will see you on Sunday morning.